What is the Main Street Caucus? Why did we do this? Well, we've got 74 members. 39 of us are in, are in marginal, tough districts. We're the ones that, when people talk about majority makers, all you got to do is look at our members. And not only are they majority makers, all of us, but there are so many people in this organization that are used to taking the tough votes, used to governing, and having to go back home and explain why we took a stand, which sometimes is difficult. I found the easiest vote to get to in Washington is no. You can always find an excuse. You can always find a reason why you voted no on something. Something as simple as, well, I didn't read the bill. I always wondered, whose fault is that? <laughs> but getting to no and explaining that no vote is simple to go back to your constituents. But getting to yes is tough. We, many of us felt, as this new administration took, took hold, that we needed another outlet. We're not the moderate group. We're a group of people that have a wide variety of, of stances on a wide variety of issues. But in the end, it's people like Fred Upton and Jeff Denham and so many of our 74 members that help write good bills on the front end. It's the Main Street members like Fred that gave us the 21st Century Cures Act. I mean, this is, that, I believe, is what stands us as an organization above everyone else. We don't want to affect it on the back end and stop good legislation. We want to make sure we write things on the front end. And that means working with each and every one of you in this room. Honored to do that. Some of our priorities before I turn it over to, uh, before I turn it over to Jeff is uh, infrastructure. I'm excited that we can hopefully play a role in the infrastructure debate, the opioid crisis. And the Main Street Caucus is working on our suburban agenda. We have recent polling from our suburban agenda and a rural agenda because it's districts like Jeff and mine that actually encompass a lot of rural America and they may be, they may have different priorities than even our suburban legislators like Fred. So with that, thank you everyone for having me. Jeff, roll on. Uh, just real quickly, Main Street has made some changes. It's always been a great organization um, that has done a lot of wonderful things where it was lacking was on the policy side of actually having an impact in the building. That's what this uh, this caucus was set up to, to be. Um, you know, when I first got into Main Street, uh, you know, it was one of those things that Steve LaTourette had to invite you to. Um, and it was kind of a more of a closed group. Um, we are now inviting a, a lot of members, and, and members are asking to join because they see a caucus that is working together, uh, not only to get to yes, uh, but also to uh, build up the speaker to let the speaker, you know, when he's looking at all the different caucuses, I've got one here that has 74 members that have voted on an issue to bring it to the floor. So when we can all agree, um, it gives the speaker the, the ability to then point to a caucus uh, that is trying to get things done. And so uh, we've taken a different position uh, this year to where we've got a policy side. Um, every week we have a, uh, um, a cross cross-section lunch and cross-section lunch with the speaker where Main Street now has a seat at the table so that we can have a discussion with the other caucuses with the speaker to talk about the issues that are important to us and there are a lot of important issues that we are not only taking a position on but that we're actually leading on and driving the agenda um, one of those is infrastructure uh, the other is am I not loud enough I can be I think this one works fine he needs two. <laughs> uh, but immigration and infrastructure are the first two that we've actually taken a very aggressive role on. Um, immigration in particular, uh, we came out with a set of principles very early to show where we stood um, in, with all the different bills that are coming forward uh, in the House and in the Senate so that we could uh, be united on, on an issue. And show that we're ready to pass something on the floor. So uh, I'm very impressed of where our caucus is right now. Uh, we continue to build not only membership, but we're building up real steam when it comes to uh, getting issues to the floor, um, having conversations with the speaker about it. And ultimately, I think the record will show for itself at the end of this uh, um, session that we were in the middle of and pushed for the reforms that actually made it to the president got signed into law. So I was elected uh, the same year that Connie Morella, we came in in the same class. Amo Houghton was a member of our class, first uh, Fortune 100 CEO, and 
he was the one that actually started uh, Main Street to, in terms of where we are today. And I can remember going to meet with our leadership, then it was Bob Michael and Trent Lott, and Newt wasn't even there yet, he was really a backbencher. Uh, and Lynn Martin, mm -hmm. wonderful member, later became Secretary of Labor, represented uh, Chicago, at Illinois. She was uh, in charge of the Republican Conference, and she said to all of the freshman Republicans, you know, if you have a good idea, two things are going to happen. We're just Republicans. We're in the minority for my lifetime then. Uh, it's either going to get defeated or it's going to get stolen. You're really not going to be all that productive. And so for me, that started off by saying, I'm going to reach out to the other side. And so my first big bill actually was with a guy in our class by the name of Kwaisi Mpumi. He later became head of the NAACP. I would think I was the only one who could say his name right. <laughs> Represented my mother-in-law. And the two of us worked on legislation that provided a tax credit for small businesses who had to comply with the Americans with Disabilities Act. And it was hailed that year as the most significant piece of legislation impacting small businesses. And I can remember Kwaisi coming down to me on the floor, putting his arms on my shoulders, and saying, Upton, you have ruined my reputation. I don't know that I can get reelected again, because I, now, I no longer have a zero with the Chamber of Commerce and the NFIB. I'm like, I hear all the small business. I got this little bulldog, and I mean, it's like, you know. So for me, it's always been whether we've been in the majority or the minority, to work with other members on both sides of the aisle to get things done. And that's how we did 21st Century Cures. We got this other big issue that we're working on literally today, immigration. I mean, it is a broken system. Uh, my district's very diverse, Southwest Michigan. I got a, an urban city like uh, Kalamazoo. I got some rural areas where, frankly, there's not even a four-lane road in the entire county. Not even, a, maybe a two-story building, but nothing taller than that, uh, other than maybe a grain elevator here or there. And our unemployment in Michigan, thanks to a really good governor, is uh, we've gone from 13, 14% down to 4%. I was at a deal with Pfizer, which is my largest employer, new, uh, nearly a, a million square foot building, um, you know, 200 new jobs uh, on Monday. Uh, all four seasons. It was 10 degrees on Monday. We got a foot and a half of snow. I was telling John, it was from my district, uh, foot and a half of snow over the weekend. I got to use uh, my wife's Christmas gift that I gave her, a snowblower with a headlight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, she has no clue as to how that thing runs, but I can hit the house next door. With it. I mean, it's, it's really good. <laughs> But you know what, immigrant, it's broken. And I got my farmers coming in, and we got better produce at recent season than, than Jeff does. But you know, they, they are losing millions, individual farmers are losing millions of dollars every year because they don't have the workers that can pick the crops. I mean, we have, we have in essence, um, uh, asparagus to apples, uh, fruit, vegetables. It's broken. We have A to Z. All right, we don't have almonds. You can have almonds or almonds. Well, how are you saying? I like almonds. But the... Yeah, yeah we have zucchini. We got zucchini. Um, Jeff's giving me a little rat. All right, anyway. Um, but it's broken, and doing nothing perpetuates the problem. And I'll tell you, we had a, a guy deported a couple weeks ago from Detroit. Actually made the national news. He came when he was about four or five years old. He married an American, came from Mexico, Jorge Garcia. Has uh, two teenage daughters now, ran a landscaping business, didn't even have a parking ticket. And ICE came in, swooped him up, and he's gone. He can't even apply to come back for 10 years. We're a better country than that. We really are. And for these folks that uh, don't, you know, they call whatever we do amnesty, it's not. We need to fix the problem. And that's why this group and others have worked very hard on an alternative that we think can pass. It's bipartisan. Guess what? Bipartisan. We're working with the Senate, working within our, our little group, and uh, today we've got a big, pretty big meeting. But, you know, the president, when he talked about immigration uh, last fall, he said, 
Congress said, I'm tired of these executive orders. I'm going to give you six months. Well, six months runs out on March 5th. And he was right. Congress, we need to fix the problem. Guess what? We have two full legislative days between now and March 5th. So the rubber's going to hit the road. I'm hoping that the Senate can do something. Uh, we'll see what, what happens today or tomorrow. Um, but we're going to be prepared, and it's called, as what Rondi said, governing. This is a problem that needs to be fixed. Whether it's the ag sector or the, the high-tech sector or whatever, uh, and you got all these dreams, they're scared to death. They know where they live. They don't, you know, they're, they're, they're scared to death. Now, we, we can do this, and, and that's what we're engaged in today. All right, Jim. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for for uh, for all these comments. Um, you know, got the budget deal, got tax reform done. Thank you so much. Congratulations. Um, you know, budget deal to your budget deal accomplished. Immigration, we all believe is going to get done. So, what's next after that for the rest of this session? I think we have to look at uh, what the administration's priorities are too, and and what was laid out this week for about the 50th week is infrastructure. Um, this one, I, I think they're finally serious. Uh, I, I think a debate on infrastructure is one that really puts uh, all of us on a path to hopefully find a bipartisan solution. Uh, unfortunately, as somebody who's served on TNI since I, I got here, um, I also see the, the pitfalls in the infrastructure debate, especially moving up towards the election. I've often said to some of you, even in the room, Kathy, um, that it's interesting to walk into uh, offices like mine and bring your members out, and, and they all want to talk about infrastructure investment. And many times they'll tell me, you know what? I went to this Republican's office, and, and, and you know what? All they kept talking about was it cost too much. I'm like, yeah, yeah, we have some of those. And then we went to this Democrat's <coughs> office, and oh, they're for everything we want. I said, of course they are. I said, because what you have here is a problem that we're going to see as this infrastructure debate goes forward if you even take out their desire not to give President Trump any victory at all. Just even if it wasn't Trump there, you have the too much crowd on our side. No matter what we do, one dollar is too much to invest. And they're going to vote no because it's not easy the to vote. I, I get it. I see it. Schuster put it on the wall in the committee room now. I have to read the quote every day I'm there. Um, and right next to Don Young. His big picture. <laughs> and then on the other side, they will tell you they are for anything. Every investment that can be. Raise whatever revenue sources you can. But when it's guys like us and groups like ours that work together with the other side and come up with a solution that can get the votes, they are nowhere to be found because it's never enough. That's why I think infrastructure is probably one of the areas that we will tackle that will suck up all the energy in the room. But we can't forget about some mom and pop issues that our polling showed that are important to our members, and especially in suburban districts. Opioid crisis, uh, college affordability, student loan debt, and also cancer research, pediatric cancer research. Simple bills that have true bipartisan support that we hope that we can convince our leadership team to get across the finish line to really separate our candidates come next election to talk about not only what we want to do, but what they're doing to affect those areas. So just one thing to uh, add on to that, you know, we did the two-year budget agreement, so it increased non-defense money. Our, you know, I got hit a little bit home from some of the folks saying, oh, what, what are you guys doing with the deficit and everything else? I said, you know, these are our priorities. You know, our roads, I'll tell you, our roads in Michigan are really, really bad. And, you know, by doing something there, by doing something on broadband, by doing something on opioids, we had opioid money in 21st century cures, but it was only two years. So it was last year and this year. I mean, it's one of the reasons how we got it done, getting it through the, the former administration. So that expires, so we've got to do more money. So it will come now out of that new amount that the budget uh, allowed us to do when we passed it last week. As we go to the next one, I'll just say strategically, we we're in a very, very good position. We cleared the decks. So... What does that mean? A lot of the um, leverage points, a lot of the issues that could have been used against us throughout the year, like the debt ceiling, like the supplemental, have all been put into this bill and put behind us. Now it gives us an opportunity to govern. So I would expect the infrastructure bill to come up next. 
um, but only slightly ahead of the farm bill. And then we've got the FAA bill that even if we can't get the full FAA bill done, we still have to reauthorize. So we've got some reauthorization bills that we're going to have to deal with. And then hopefully we finish out the year, as Rodney said, with a number of bills that are necessary, it's time, but it's also the right thing to do, and I, and I think it'll show the American public that uh, we can govern. Um, you know, from the beginning days of this session, the big question has been, will we have a wave election and uh, see a, a changeover in the House, or will we be able to hold our seats? We are governing now. We're off to a good start after getting tax reform and getting this uh, uh, funding bill done, but the next job is getting infrastructure, which I can tell you from a House perspective, there's nothing more important not only to our committee on TNI, but to the majority leader. This is our opportunity to solve our water crisis in California. So we take this infrastructure bill very, very serious. It's not just about highways and, and ports. Those are all important infrastructure issues, but there's nothing that's been more important in our entire career than water storage in California. That's why I'm so confident we're gonna get it done.